this meeting of the San Jose Charter Commission to order. And I'd ask that the clerk take the roll. I'll take the roll, uh, beginning with Barbara Marshman. Here. Christina Johnson. Here. Elizabeth Monley. Ellie Matsumura. Enrico Callender. Good evening. Frank Maitsky. Here. Eric Percival. George Sanchez. Hui Tran. Here. Jeremy Bruce. Here. Jose Posadas. Glenn Dieppe. Linda Lazat. Luis Barosio. Magnolia Siegel. Present. Maria Fuentes. Sammy Robledo. Here. Terry Segura. T. Tran. Present. Tobin Gilman. Here. Veronica Amador. Here. Dong Zhao. Here. I see Garrick Percival. Derek, would you affirm you're here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Monley will not be joining us tonight. Um, she did check in earlier. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. And we have a full um, a calendar of speakers tonight. So I want to get started as quickly as we can so that we can hear from our speakers. Um, as been the um, the format that we've used before, we have a half hour for our speakers, and then we open up for commissioners' questions and answers um, in conversation with the speakers uh, at 5.30. And we'll starting at 6 o'clock, we go to commissioners' questions. The second speaker will then start at 6.30. The Q&A follows. Then the third speaker will start at 7.30. Uh, and then public comment comes at the end of all the different speakers. Um, so just to um, alert our public um, members who are joining us this evening. Um, I want to get started um, with the introductions of our first set of speakers. Um, Bonnie Sugiyama is the director of the Pride Center and Gender Equity Center at San Jose State University. Uh, Senator Sarah Fernando and Maribel Martinez are coming from the county office at Santa Clara County Office of LGBTQ Affairs. I'm going to start with Who's, who's beginning the presentation? I see the county steps up. Excuse Wonderful. Me. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, this is Elian Matsumura. I just wanted to apologize for being late, let you know I'm here. Uh, apologize for being off camera. Uh, I will get on camera as soon as my computer is done crashing. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Matsumura. And uh, we'll note that you are now in attendance. Um, so we're gonna start with Good afternoon. Buenas tardes, Marichusku. My name is Maribel Martinez with the County of Santa Clara Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Uh, Sarah and Bonnie will lead our presentation, and I will be available after the presentation for questions. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah and Bonnie. Hey, folks. Um, my name is Sarah. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Senior Management Analyst for the Office of LGBTQ Affairs. And I use she, her pronouns. I also want to introduce Bonnie really quickly. So Bonnie, if you don't mind introducing yourself as well. Yeah, hi, for sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Bonnie Sugiyama. I use the pronouns of the and she, and I'm the director of the Pride Center and the Gender Equity Center at San Jose State University. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And today we're going to be discussing SOGI 101, Gender Inclusive Language. This was the ask uh, from the commission to be able to talk about um, things uh, or, or recommendations regarding to gender inclusive language. So we wanted to ensure that Office of LGBTQ Affairs as well as San Jose State uh, Pride Center is here to help support um, the, the recommendations and, and kind of like the, the things that are needed to talk about gender inclusive language. So uh, first off, and just making sure everyone can see my screen, is that okay? Yeah. Recording in progress. Awesome. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about important terminology. And um, when it comes to sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, or what I will refer to as SOGI, 
Um, I just want folks to be able to just take a look at this picture. And we use this as a phrasing in terms of thinking about, and if you have any reflections and you don't necessarily have to come off chat, this is more of a self-reflection exercise. And when you look at this picture, we just want you to think about sexual orientation, gender identity expression in the context of this one picture. And think about some of the words that you would use to describe this image. What are some of the emotions that you feel about this image? What do you find interesting about this image? What surprises you? And what questions do you have? Again, this is self-reflection, just thinking about it. Some of the themes that might come up is that when you look at these folks, we can't necessarily assume, nor should we assume, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. We can't simply tell someone's gender identity or sexual orientation just by looking at them. And what we're going to talk about is uh, seeing what we could do to avoid making these assumptions on gender identity and sexual orientation based on how people look, as well as give recommendations as to creating gender inclusive language. So to create a foundation of what we're going to be talking about, again, SOGI, I'll be using SOGI as a word a lot, is the acronym for sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. So sexual orientation is the direction of an individual's sexual, emotional, and or romantic attraction. This includes lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, heterosexual or straight, asexual and queer. So the LGBT or LGBTQ part of the uh, LGBTQ acronym is um, stated a lot within sexual orientation, but we also want to bring up gender identity. And gender identity relates to a person's internal experience of their gender. It's one's, most, uh, one's innermost sense of being a man, a woman, or another gender, which may or may not align with a person's sex assignment. All right. This includes transgender. So transgender being the umbrella term uh, used to describe a person whose gender identity does not align with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Another terminology includes trans, transgender woman, trans woman, trans man, uh, trans masculine, and trans feminine. Also includes non-binary. So uh, non-binary is the gender identity that indicates the person does not identify within a binary of exclusively a man or a woman and non-binary, which we'll be talking about extensively today, uh, also includes uh, gender non-conforming, gender diverse, and gender expansive. And also I wanna go over cisgender. So when I use the word cisgender, it describes a person whose gender uh, identity aligns with their sex assignment at birth. So again, this all falls under gender identity. As for gender expression, this includes the ways in which a person uh, pre uh, presents their gender identity to society. This includes clothing, body language, hairstyle, interests, behaviors, mannerisms. Uh, you cannot assume one's gender identity simply by observing their gender expression. And gender expression is something that is directly influenced by time and culture. Yeah. And last but not least, Sex assignment at birth is long, uh, although it's not mentioned in the SOGI acronym, it might not sound maybe SOGIs, <laughs> but it's not as fancy. Uh, but sex assignment at birth is something that we also discuss when uh, discussing uh, SOGI. So sex assignment is, uh, it could be a label, a male or female, assigned by a doctor to infants at birth based on a combination of biological characteristics, including chromosomes, hormones, and reproductive organs. This is also referred to as birth sex or uh, designated sex. So this is some of the foundational knowledge when we talk about SOGI. And I just want to give a, a brief graphic on how SOGI could look in the form of a, an image. So this is used by the Trans Student Educational Resources, uh, TSER. And this gender unicorn points to gender identity, gender expression, sex assignment, uh, sex assigned at birth, physical attraction and emotional attraction through this uh, simple graphic. This is actually used in educational spaces. You might have seen this as uh, the gender bred person. Um, there's also other graphics that are out there that share this. Um, one thing to note is that 
Um, this doesn't necessarily show gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation um, as a spectrum. And this is something that we want to um, highly recommend uh, in terms of updates because we see arrows that are pointing towards one direction. We want to uh, acknowledge that uh, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression is a whole spectrum of identities, okay? And I'll use myself as an example. So um, looking at this um, graph right over here, we took apart some pieces of the, the unicorn. And in terms of sex assigned at birth, I'm just gonna use myself as an example. So my sex assigned at birth was male. My current gender identity is woman. My gender expression is between the lines of feminine and androgynous. Most of the time I'm, I present as feminine, but sometimes I just don't really feel like going out as, as feminine as I want to be, especially if I'm just working out going to the gym or even going to Target. It's something that I don't necessarily focus too much on. So I, I feel that my gender expression is within uh, between feminine and androgynous. And as for sexual orientation, I identify as bi, but more outside of the spectrum as someone that identifies as asexual or someone that, that feels little to no sexual uh, attractions or feelings. So I put my star outside of that spectrum. All this to say that everybody has a sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex assigned at birth. So when we talk about um, LGBTQ 101, which a lot of folks ask for, what we're really talking about is sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression 101, or a training that involves SOGI, because SOGI, everybody has a SOGI, and everybody could relate on where they are within that spectrum of sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. So as for inclusive language, something that I want to talk about is some data that currently exists. Uh, the Williams Institute, a highly regarded um, research institution on LGBTQ issues, uh, reported recently within the past month that 1.2 million LGBTQ people in the United States, that's around 11%, identify as non-binary. And a majority of those folks um, are under the age of 29 and live in urban areas. And a majority of non-binary adults also use queer, bisexual, pansexual, or asexual to describe their sexual orientation. All this to say that we need to be proactive in supporting this emerging workforce. And when it comes to future electorates in, in, in government work, in, in, in public sector, we have to be mindful of inclusion and ensure that we include um, non-binary folks within the language that we create in the policies and pro programs and any kind of documentation that we create to be as inclusive of, as we can. So that being said, some suggestions that we have when it comes to uh, language and gender inclusive terms, instead of using terms like you guys or ladies and gentlemen, you could use y'all, folks, everyone, distinguished guests, distinguished colleagues. Instead of using him or her, you could use them as the singular. And I don't know if, folks, I don't know if you folks know this, but the term them was uh, the uh, word of the year for 2019. So the importance of using them as a singular and practicing it is very important when it comes to uh, being inclusive of all gender identities. Instead of using boy or girl, using child or kid, instead of using lady or guy, using person. Instead of using uh, hello, sir, or hello, ma'am, just saying hello or hi there. And, and really quickly, just a note on salutations as a sign of respect. A lot of people use sir or ma'am as a sign of respect. But if we're actually being respectful of other folks, it's, it's being respectful by not assuming that a gendered greeting is aligned with someone's perceived gender identity. So using or just saying hello, hi there, say it with a smile, say it with like positive body language, say it with intent, you know? Being able to say it without using gender terms is very important. And other things that to consider is uh, instead of using mom or dad, using parent, guardian, or caregiver, instead of using brother, sister, nephew, or niece, using sibling or nibbling. Other terms that could be used, uh, Instead of using transgendered, transgender, transgenders, transvestite, transsexual, tranny, these are all outdated terms. And we could use someone who is transgender or people who are transgender or transgender. 
as uh, a reference to transgender individuals and community members. As for sexual preference or lifestyle choice, it's not a preference, it's not a choice, it's sexual orientation. As for the term hermaphrodite, that's something that's not used um, in today's language. Uh, the correct term is intersex. And as for sex change operation, using gender affirming surgery as a way of affirming one's um, journey when it comes to exploring gender. Other considerations, we also use this for TSER, uh, the same folks that created the unicorn, um, being mindful of their other uh, gender pronouns that exist within the spectrum and being able to practice, right? So when you someone leaves their wallet or see, leaves their umbrella, do you say someone left his wallet or her wallet? Normally people say someone left their wallet, someone left their phone, someone left their umbrella, right? Being, use, being able to use they more regularly because believe it or not, you're already using it, right? as well as asking folks for their pronouns. So in terms of pronoun etiquette, um, the way a person looks or dresses is not always an indicator of what pronouns they use. Um, it is okay for, is it okay? It is okay to normalize asking for someone's pronouns and sharing yours as well. That actually opens up the um, conversation when it comes to pronouns. Also people should be given the, the space to pass. It shouldn't be obligatory to be able to share your pronouns. People should be able to uh, give their pronouns if they are able to and if they're willing, right? If one person in a group is invited to share their pronouns, everyone should feel invited to share, but not feel obligated, just like I said. And make sure to check in with individuals whether uh, pronouns are safe to use around other people. And in practice, saying my name is and my pronouns are. So I opened up this meeting um, by saying my, my name is Sarah. I use she, her pronouns right? Being able to use that as commonplace when it comes to meetings, when it comes to uh, representing yourself, when it comes to your introductions, right? And also adding pronouns in Zooms or emails, that is a great indicator as a visual representation. Really quickly on birth name and chosen name, I'm not going to go too much into this, but in terms of using someone's chosen name, their current name, it's very important as a chosen name is something that identifies an, as an individual, right? And making sure that we don't call people by what the trans community calls uh, someone's dead name, making sure that we're accurate by asking about the name that they go by. And when it comes to tripping gracefully, we all make mistakes, totally get it. Um, what's very important is that we minimize harm and move forward, right? So one, immediately correct your mistake if you misgender or dead name someone and apologize and move on. It does not have to be a spectacle. It does not have to be a conversation. It does not have to be a, a full-blown kind of like a explanation as to how you're learning in this process. Uh, no more commentary or explanation is necessarily needed. Another recommendations uh, by way of some of the uh, questions that you folks uh, sent to us. Uh, we do have recommendations on inclusive subject options. So when creating documents, uh, using the universal they as plural for he or she. So when you're looking at a document, when you see he or she, that enforces the binary. And what we want to move away from is enforcing the binary to ensure that everyone feels included within the documents and policies that are created. So using they as a plural for he or she works wonders. Using them for as a, as a plural for him and her works wonders, right? And there's also the, the option to include they as a third option. So if you do elect to use he, she, also including they, he, she, they, or he, sh him, her, them, right? Making sure that those options are available to include non-binary identities or folks that identify as gender expansive. And also reworking, st re uh, reworking structures to make sentences and phrases uh, plural or even referencing subjects by name only. That works wonders as well. Rather than using he, she, or they, just using or their name uh, within any document or making any reference point. Other recommendations that we have um, for restructuring language, um, using gender neutral language is very important. Best practice for Spanish, it's using E at the end of some of the gender terms that are out there. 
another best practice, and, and this is a little uh, shout out to one of the uh, older adult surveys that we have going on. If you want more information, you know who, who to reach out to. Um, but also creating com a community advisory committee um, that has LGBTQ cultural competency wow. of the languages that you're looking for. So if you have someone that translates from Vietnamese, Tagalog, um, Chinese, Spanish, making sure that someone with a LGBTQ cultural competency also reviews that document to make sure it's affirming of the audience that you're trying to reach, right? And also making sure language is clear and understood, right? So all this to say, we have available training for y'all. Um, I know there's no chat feature in these committee meetings, but what we'll do is we'll be able to share one of the trainings that we have. It's called Building a More Inclusive Workplace LGBTQ. It's completely free to y'all as part of uh, your committee. And it's a 30 minute module that provides both didactic instruction on LGBT terminology, as well as its conversation simulation that helps create uh, or helps uh, your capacity building in creating a more inclusive work environment, or in this case, a committee meeting, or in this case, just helping community members. So we'll be able to share more information about that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Bonnie, who's going to talk a little bit about what they have going on at Pride Center. So take it away, Bonnie. I'm share my screen. All right, thanks, everyone. So, um, you know, relating this to the, the, the Charter Commission and, and writing um, and, and, you know, the document itself. So looking at... Um, the transition of language over the over the years and being inclusive of gender neutral uh, and gender inclusive language, you know, I want to look at professional writing. So what we've seen over the last few years is uh, uh, more inclusion within professional style guides. So in 2017, the Associated Press uh, updated their style book to include the usage of they, them, theirs in press publications. Uh, and their reasoning is because not all people fall under one of two categories for sex or gender, according to leading medical organizations. So avoid all references to both either or opposite sexes or genders as a way to encompass all people. We also see this in the APA. So, uh, you know, in academic writing and in professional writing, a lot of people use uh, the APA publication manual. So in 2019, the APA also updated the seventh edition of their manual to include the use of the singular uh, singular they um, to be used as a generic third person singular pronoun in English uh, to be used as a singular they is endorsed as part of the APA style because it's inclusive of all people and helps writers avoid making assumptions about gender. We also want to use it, um, according to them, when referring to a generic person whose gender is unknown or it's irrelevant, irrelevant to the context uh, of the document. So use a singular they as a pronoun. And I think, you know, really looking at that and thinking about the, um, the context of the, the San Jose City Charter, you'll see in a second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how much gender is actually um, woven throughout the whole document. And some of you might be actually quite shocked. Um, so the APA also um, wants to discourage the use of the singular they, or so talking about, it, at one point, historically, uh, the singular they was discouraged uh, in academic writing, but many groups have now endorsed it, including uh, the APA and the Associated Press. And, you know, talking about uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, um, Sarah also brought this up uh, that, you know, it was the, the word of the year in 2019. And really looking at the recognize, recognition of the transition of language over time. If you think about language, you know, a lot of people like to say that language is stagnant and that, you know, language is language and, and there's rules. Well, there are a lot of rules, but the rules also change. So if you were to go back and, and, and read documents from 50 years to 100 years ago, it would be very different. And even I would challenge you, even 100 years ago, if you look at some of the writing, it may be kind of difficult to understand, right? So that's one of the reasons why the dictionary exists and they add new words is because they're, you know, they're evolving with the way that language is currently being used today. So what does this mean for governing documents and standards? So we have a couple of examples of um, some national and international uh, groups using uh, and having their own 
a language, gender inclusive language manual. So NATO has one. And, you know, just like some of the, the gender inclusive movement of the, you know, the 60s, 70s and 80s, you know, transitioning using, um, you know, chairman to chair or policeman to police officer, uh, cleaning lady to cleaner, fireman to firefighter and cameraman to videographer, you know, we try to make things more inclusive and and not just be um, kind of stereotyped that, that only men were doing those positions, right? Uh, so now we're, we're talking about trying to make sure that language is inclusive of all people now that we're, we're seeing more people who are identifying uh, on the spectrum or outside of the spectrum of gender. And so what does this mean for kind of for more progressive writing as, as we're looking at you know, documents? So I'll, I'll read some of these examples. So one that would be less inclusive would be plans to outsource some 19 services have not proceeded at the anticipated pace as there are significant manpower shortages. Well, to make that inclusive, you would substitute manpower with staffing shortages. It doesn't change the, the nature of it too much except for making it you know, more inclusive. Um, doesn't add a whole bunch of extra words, right? Um, but it, it gets to the point. Another way to do it is actually to eliminate gender from the sentence at all. So the next example is requests the emergency relief coordinator to continue his or her efforts to strengthen the coordination of humanitarian assistance. Or you could word it as request the emergency relief coordinator to continue efforts to strengthen the coordination of humanitarian assistance. You know, it's a sentence that doesn't need gender in it at all. So why bother putting it in there? So as far as recommendations, um, as far as looking at the charter itself and, and what you might do as, as a body, um, this is actually how often gender appears in the charter. It's 140 total spots in the charter itself. There are four references to his that I think were missed at one point when it was updated back in the day. Um, 40, 49 instances of his or hers, 48 instances of he or she, and nine incident instances of him or her. So, you know, given the examples that I gave earlier, you can either use they, them, or you can eliminate the use of gender um, just through, um, you know, small modifications to the document itself and within those sentence structures. The other thing that I think should actually be, be removed, and I think probably should have been removed when um, the language was updating to, updated to say he or she, um, is in section 1704 under definitions, uh, item H, that says the masculine gender includes the feminine and the neuter. I think that that was trying to say that he was inclusive of feminine and gender neutrality. Um, historically, the word neuter comes from being able, like uh, words were gendered, and so they were listed as masculine, feminine, or neuter. Uh, neuter was that they didn't have gender at all. Um, so I think that this, this particular line could probably be removed uh, because it really doesn't serve any purpose in this document anymore. And so just kind of looking forward, uh, you know, for recommend recommendations and, you know, I, you know, I'm not an expert in this area and, and you all have probably read this document a ton more than I have because I just brief have briefly been reviewing it the last couple of weeks, but whether or not that this is uh, your area or not, um, you know, the idea of making the charter uh, more, um, uh, the non-gendered language or gender inclusive language be included in the charter, it itself lays the foundation for legislation at the city council level to begin using gender inclusive and gender neutral language throughout the city's business and the communications with, uh, with the community itself. So, you know, you can use, use these pieces as guidance for the charter itself. Um, and or if you feel like it's appropriate to talk about um, and make guidance on how the city uh, you know, produces documentation going forward in the future with how they legislate city documents and communications to make them gender inclusive um, or gender neutral as necessary to make them you know, more welcoming and inclusive of, of all of our community members within the city of San Jose. And with that, I think we're open for questions. Thank you to both of our speakers and thanks to Maribel for being here to join us. Um, I'm gonna call on folks, Commissioner Tran. Uh, good evening and thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I'm actually just curious since you with uh, since uh, Sarah and Bonnie are both with the county office, did the county undergo a similar um, effort to 
uh, take out gender references uh, from the county documents and county records as well? We are currently in the process of, of that. Yeah, and I left a little clue I forgot to talk about, but our Human Rights Commission uh, brought this as, as a subject in uh, March of this year. So <clears throat> we're currently exploring. And um, we do have um, links to the documents so we could actually share that with y'all if you folks are interested in that current kind of work. So it was like a little snip that I forgot to mention that the Human Rights Commission actually um, is bringing up that as a, as a initiative uh, and it was introduced this year. Cool. And yeah. is y'all used in any of the county records? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, is y'all used in any of the county records? I was just curious. I mean, I use it all the time. Uh, I don't believe it's in any of the county records, but we use it in our best practices uh, in terms of gender inclusive language in, as an option, uh, in, including in the list that uh, Sarah uh, presented to the group. Okay, I actually appreciate that. I would actually like to see that. I just want to clarify that I'm not with the county. I'm, I'm here um, with San Jose State University and the recommendations are coming from me, not from the county the county folks, because they can't make recommendations. Thanks for the clarification, uh, Bonnie. Other, other questions, like feedback, comments? I'm seeing none. Oh, um, I have my. I'm sorry. I was I was I was slow to find the, the button. Um, so uh, I I did have a question. Um, just if there's anything further to share, in terms of um, the <clears throat> the best practices for government documents. You know, you shared the example of manpower versus staffing, or the possibility of just eliminating gendered language. You know, I'm thinking especially in terms of pronouns. Um, the use of they as a sort of a best or, or broadly shared practice could change, shoot the use of any of it could change, right? And, and so that, um, you know, on the front of, for the other, for other gendered language, it's a little bit easier to see, you know, how to make those switches. For pronouns, you know, you can replace it with just, you know, instead of saying, the city manager, he, she, they, you could just say the city manager and repeat that, but I'm, I'm curious what you've seen um, for for best practices in in replacing pronouns and whether it's actually just trying to minimize the use of pronouns, you know, to to minimize the need to change the document or uh, or how that's worked. And thank you for the presentation. Sure, and I could share um, that what is helpful, particularly in government documents, is to be specific as to uh, what you know who the pronoun is um, referring to. So. Uh, sometimes um, pronouns could be, um, or the writing could be ambiguous, but if you repeat, you know, the city manager can do this, the city manager can do that, the city that it becomes clear, you know, who the action, uh, who the subject and, and who's taking action in that particular sentence. Um, and so that uh, adds, for, adds for specificity and, and clarity in the document. Um, you know, sometimes when we're writing, um, you know, whether it's the action or the or the the subject or the object of the sentence to make that really clear saying you know city manager will deliver this to the staff members to the clients to the community members instead of to them because that could be left for um, unclear interpretation so uh, either um, replacing it with who specifically you intend um, in the sentence um, or the inclusion of uh, either a singular they or then explicitly right now what's most common um, is that there is a, a, a prevalence of, of three most common pronouns with this which are she he and they so there are options for the um, for this body to explain and and i would argue like what is the point of putting gender in the document in the first place? Like, why not just use a gender neutral pronoun that just is kind of inclusive of, of all people, regardless of gender? Um, you know, reading up many of the, the, the lines in the charter, like gender really doesn't have anything to do with 
the item itself. So why does it why does it need to be in there? Is is always my question. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions, feedback? I'm seeing none. Um, so oh, I want to say. Sorry. I'm sorry. I have my hand up. Sorry. I'm sorry. The challenge is that with the screens, anyone's background, it's hard to see that their hand's up. So thank you for calling it out. Uh, Commissioner Amador. Yes, I just want to thank our speakers for coming tonight. Um, I really appreciate your presentation um, and really uh, hope to see more presentations around like this in, uh, in different places, right? In different places within our government, um, within our school systems, um, as we try to make sure that everybody feels included and they feel also um, respected by whatever their pronoun is. Um, so I do want to thank you all for making that beautiful presentation. It was really well done. Um, and I got a lot of information out of that. So thank you so much. Thank you. And one thing I, I will advise is again, we do offer up uh, training for y'all if you want to expand your knowledge is free to y'all as uh, part of this committee. So uh, again, this might not be not this is not the last interaction we'll all have. Uh, we're here to really support your work. And if you folks have questions on gender inclusive language, if you have a paragraph or, or a statement or something that you just want, you know, uh, another reviewer just to look into, feel free to, um, all, on behalf of Office of LGBTQ Affairs, we could definitely take a look and help support where we can. Yeah, and, that, and just to add that, that, that the training is available to um, all our um, government employees and nonprofits free of charge uh, on behalf of the county. And I'll include, um, I'll send along all the links that I had to all the resources and style guides that, that do exist um, so that you can utilize those in, in your research. Great, thank you. Any other commissioners speaking on this issue? Uh, Commissioner Sigel. Commissioner Sigel, you're on mute. Thank you, Chair. Where do you think is the best place for um, our speakers to send the information and how do you think it will be sent to the commission? Um, thank you for the question. I'm just gonna conclude with that. Um, if the speakers could send it to uh, Megan Roche on our, at the city's uh, clerk's office, and that's who we've had communications with, then um, we can get all the resources to our commissioners. Um, tomorrow is a one mailing, but it can always be gone. If we get it later, we can always send it out. We send out mailings to commissioners on Fridays. So Megan, you have your hand up. I just wanted to add that you can send that directly to charter review at San Jose CA DACA. Thank you. Great. And we will definitely pass on those resources to our consultant as well. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to Bonnie and Sarah and Manabel for their, um, not only for being here with us tonight, but for their work in the community uh, and their advocacy work throughout and helping us to have a more inclusive community. So uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken to be with us tonight and all the work and preparation for tonight, uh, but the work that you're doing in our community. So thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and I will say good night to you. Um, our second speaker, which we'll get um, right to, I see is here, um, is, uh, uh, Robert Brownstein or Bob Brownstein, uh, former budget director for Mayor Susan Hammer. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Bob. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I have spoken to the commission earlier. If you remember, I made a presentation on the 1985 Charter Review Commission, which I was a member of. And if you recall, I described the work of that commission in terms of its efforts to try and um, significantly increase the role of the legislative body, the city council, the representative institution versus the role of the administrative body, the city manager in the city of San Jose, and also to 
in combination with district elections and some other measures to further democratize decision making in the city and increase the ability of average people to be represented in city decision making. And my view then and my view now is that that charter commission and the measures that went along with it, district elections, having the city council have a full-time salary and have their own staff, et cetera, were extraordinarily effective in breaking the power of the city manager that existed prior to that point and also to increasing representation. However, I think we have to acknowledge that in the 35 years since the 1985 um, Charter Commission, um, while there have been some positive changes, there also has been a very significant failure in San Jose to resolve what is probably the greatest challenge to the ability of the city to meet the needs of the full spectrum of its population. And that failure is the inability to deal with the truly massive levels of inequality, economic and political inequality that exists in San Jose today. The level of inequality truly shapes life for an extraordinarily large part of the city population. And inequity is widespread in so many aspects of life, in housing, in healthcare, in jobs, in incomes, in education, in political representation, in law enforcement, and in others. That's, that isn't even the full list. Um, so the challenge before us is to find a way to be able to significantly reduce the levels of in inequity and the lack of inclusion that characterize life in San Jose for so many of the people who live here. Um, now, the reason that I think we failed in 1985 to set steps in motion to do better in terms of increasing equity and increasing inclusion is that we looked simply at formal mechanisms of uh, political processes, district elections, which made it easier for um, people of color and people who represented minority constituencies to get elected. Um, and that was true, but the fact is today, in a general election in District 5, probably half the number of people vote as in District 9 or in District 10. So the level of political participation is still dramatically weaker in some parts of the city and amongst in some constituencies than others, despite the formal equality of district size, which we achieved when we passed district elections. And there are reasons for that in terms of the challenges that people who are low income and subject to discrimination face in terms of their, their basic existence and how that impacts their ability and willingness to politically participate. Because of this, I think we need to ask the city charter, demand of the city charter, that it fundamentally take on the challenge of trying to increase equity and increase inclusion. Now, when I say that, I'm not suggesting a Pollyannish approach. I'm not suggesting that you put language in the city charter and the result is going to be structural racism is going to vanish in San Jose. What I am saying is the challenges to reducing inequity, the challenges to promoting inclusion are so formidable that we need to use every mechanism, every tool, every institution that we have in order to be able to make progress. And that means we use the city charter as well as a host of other institutions and mechanisms. So it's not the charter in itself, but the charter has to be part of a broader effort to make progress, to achieve equity and to achieve inclusion. Now in the specific proposals that I'm shortly going to present to you. Um, 
I try and design pro-equity and pro-inclusion language that is suitable for and fits in a city charter. I don't put forward mandates that require the city to do things that no one knows how to do. That, that produces disillusionment in government and in um, government institutions. Um, I don't micromanage in these proposals and don't try and use the charter to, to do things in terms of government operations that really require some level of flexibility and some ability to make changes as circumstances change as they inevitably um, do. Um, but what I, what I do think the charter can do is what I include in these proposals. And I believe it, by the way, everyone has a copy of these. I sent them into the, the appropriate places. Uh, with a, a, a sufficient time. Uh, what, I, what I do think we can put into the charter is a statement of values. We can put into the charter equity standards as goals, and we can put into the charter a mechanism for equity assessment. And that's what these proposals do. So what I'd like to do at this point is move directly to the proposals that I've made and walk through each of those sections. And then I'd be very happy to answer any questions um, that people have. And, and by the way, just to indicate my own perspective as the primary author of these proposals, um, these are the efforts of one person who's talked to some other people in the community uh, to try and come up with the best kind of language that I can think of that will advance these goals. But this language did not come down from Mount Sinai. It is amendable. Um, there are other people with good views and good mental capacities who can probably figure out ways to make this stronger or better. And I welcome those comments and those changes. Um, so let me just say that um, up front. OK. The first part of this proposal is a fundamentally a statement of values. What does what do the people of San Jose affirm as in terms of their beliefs and their political values regarding equity um, and inclusion? The charter already has in it statements of values. For example, it has in it a provision that uh, requires a code of ethics. That is the value that public employees should work and live to the highest ethical standards. It also has prohibit prohibitions against discrimination, which again is a statement of values. But what it lacks, while it has the, the prohibition against discrimination, it lacks the affirmative emphasis on equity. Um, and that's what I'm trying to achieve with this um, statement of values. Um, so um, uh, what this... Um, provision would do is state that the people of the city of San Jose affirm that the decisions, policies, budgets, programs, and practices of the city, that is the city government, shall be guided by the principles of racial and social equity, inclusion, and racial and social justice. And then I use for the definitions of those terms, I use the definitions basically that come from the city's own Department of Equity. Um, I modify it somewhat based on comments that I've had heard from other people that um, it should be clear that it's not just racial equity, but there are also equity issues um, that apply to other constituencies that have been victimized by discrimination or oppression and that the language should include those as well. So that's, it's, that's a modification of the language that you'd find on the um, city website. Um, that's the first um, proposal. Um, the second proposal is equity standards. That is, okay, we now have a statement of values that we support equity, but what does that mean in actual practice? Um, the closest thing to a set of equity standards that this commission has heard in its previous presentations is the Detroiters Bill of Rights. 
Now, I'm taking a different perspective than the Detroiters' Bill of Rights, because to me, the Detroit Bill of Rights, in many cases, promises what no one knows how to deliver. So it says, right to housing. Every Detroit resident is entitled to affordable, habitable, safe, and accessible housing. I certainly would agree that that should apply to Detroit and to San Jose. But I've been working on affordable housing issues for 40 years, and I don't know how to do that. And I don't know anyone who does. Um, and the Detroit Bill of Rights is, has a number of measures like that, where it states a goal, but um, there really is, there's no language, no strategy that makes that goal realistic. And I'm hopeful that we can have something in the San Jose Charter that leads us to more feasible action. So the, the approach that I've taken in the equity standards is to look at areas of life where the city is already engaged, safety, parks and rec, transportation, economic development, housing standards, neighborhood amenities, et cetera. And for each of these, indicate that the city should, to the greatest extent that it can, again, it's a, um, it's a goal, it's not a mandate, nobody's gonna be able to litigate over this, but it gives a direction to the city council if approved by the voters, that for all of these areas of city action, the city's goal should be that every resident achieves and receives the same level of city support or city benefits or city determined quality of life as every other resident. So if the city is able to send code enforcement inspectors to look at substandard housing, that service is not disproportionately provided to wealthier neighborhoods as opposed to poorer neighborhoods, to areas that are primarily white as opposed to areas that are primarily people of color. If the city is providing water and sanitation services, though it's to the greatest extent possible, should be available to people throughout the city, regardless of their income, regardless of their, their ethnicity. Um, people who live in the city should be as confident that they are not likely to be victimized in terms of personal safety or the safety of their property, either from other people or from city agencies themselves, whoever they are, no matter what part of the city they live in. And that's what the equity standards is attempting to achieve. Again, it's a goal. It's not a magic wand. We don't have magic wands in the charter. The third um, aspect of this is equity assessment. The city makes major, major budget decisions, and it also makes major policy decisions every year. The people of the city ought to know what the impact, <clears throat> what the impact of those decisions will be on equity and inclusion. Therefore, what this measure does is create a process through which for every annual city budget and for major policy decisions, there will be an equity assessment. That is, there will be a formal review of the way in which this budget or this policy proposed policy change uh, impacts uh, vulnerable constituencies. Impacts, in, and there's a list of the potential impacts, uh, impacts their quality of representation or access to decision-making, impacts the extent to which they receive city benefits and services, um, uh, et cetera. Um, now, an obvious question when one hears this proposal is, okay, we know what the city budget is. You can, it's the right, recommended budget that's put out by the city manager every year. So you want to have a equity assessment of that, but what's a major policy change? Well, what I've done is essentially said, that's gonna be decided by a political process, as opposed to me trying to say today, what I think all the potential policy changes will be in perpetuity, which I don't think would be a realistic thing to do. The process is the following components. A majority of the city council can define a policy change as major, 
and thereby triggering an equity assessment, or 2,500 residents can submit a petition saying they believe a policy change is substantial enough that it should be considered major and should trigger an equity assessment. Where did the number 2,500 come from? It's a judgment call. I wanted to have a number that was not so de minimis that you know any five people having a beer could decide that some potential policy is going to be a major one and sign their names you know on the napkin and you've triggered a uh, an equity assessment. On the other hand, I didn't want to have a level of public um, request to be so large that it's not realistic to think that people would ever be able to, uh, on their own, uh, generate the demand that um, uh, something is a major policy change. Based on my years of involvement in local politics, I thought 2,500 meets those criteria. Um, and if commissioners disagree, they're, they're welcome to try and um, determine what, other, what number would um, uh, be more suitable. The, uh, the equity assessment should be done well in advance of the measure coming before the city council. It should be made public at least two weeks ahead and it should be debated uh, at a public hearing. So those are the, um, in, the in broad stroke, um, the major um, components of these equity proposals. Um, their objective, as I said earlier, is to bring the drive for equity inclusion frontally and fundamentally into the city charter and to try and do it in a way that is reasonable considering the role of the charter in city governments and governance. And I'd be happy now to answer any questions um, that anyone has. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate your thoughtful presentation and I'm gonna go to commissioners. Commissioner Marshman. Hey, Bob. Um, can you think of policies, I'm sure you can, uh, that have been enacted over the last even 20 years that should have had an equity analysis and might have been changed if they had had that analysis? Uh, might have been changed, I don't know. <laughs> um, that's kind of- um, could, could have been. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of, just some of the recent ones, um, the, uh, the whole Google project could have had an equity analysis. Uh, some of the major fee waivers downtown um, could have had uh, 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 an equity analysis. Um, uh, changes in the role of the IP, IPO, the independent police order, uh, could have had an equity uh, analysis. Um, and probably, although this was a good part of county work, but it was also city involved, but the response to the pandemic also could have had um, an equity analysis. Other commissioners, uh, Commissioner Amador. Yes, thank you. Um, and Bob, as we're talking right now about the equity analysis, would you be um, open to specifically talking about the GEAR um, equity analysis, just because it would also align with our equity and diverse, our equity, I forgot, com not commission, but office of equity that was established last year um, by council as well. And I know that they're trained on that GARE toolkit, GARE analysis. So it would be in hand and not just any equity analysis, but it would be a very comprehensive um, GARE, which is a government alliance uh, for racial equity um, toolkit anal analysis that they do. Would you be open to changing that? Um you should, I mean, I can't recall everything that's in the GARE analysis, but there are a number of equity assessments that are out there. Um, um, I looked at a few, um, 
actually the city's department has a website that directs you to a few. Um, and um, the ones that I looked at seem to spend most of their time trying to figure out which constituency should be covered by the analysis as opposed to trying to figure out what's the best way to do the analysis. Um, I, don't, I think the first question is a valid one, but I'm also really interested in that the analysis is done in a, in a positive way. And that's why I, I indicated some um, factors. Um, you know, if the GARE analysis is a better way to do it, I wanna do it the best way possible. Or if the GARE analysis adds something to what I have uh, and they can be merged, so much the better. I mean, the point here is to have um, an equity assessment that meets the needs of the people who live in the city. And um, I, I, I would be delighted if this is improved on. Yes. Um, and I just want to be uh, make sure that we're like clear on the language because I don't want to uh, later on see something that, uh, you know, they're pulling different equity analysis using different equity analysis for each year, um, you know, and kind of like, as we seem sometimes taking shortcuts on that. Um, so I was wondering if putting an actual name, you know, an actual analysis that we that we are recommending for the city to use would be helpful um, instead of leaving it up to them. Well, I mean, this this language doesn't leave it completely up to the city government because it includes a substantial number of things that would have to be in the analysis. My only hesitancy about saying the analysis we're going to use is the analysis that some third party organization puts together is we don't know what's going to happen to that third party organization into the future. I mean, they may turn out to come up with the best ideas in the world or maybe not. So you, I think you want to be somewhat cautious about hanging, hanging your hat with some organization without knowing what's going to happen with that organization over time. Now, if, if the current GARE assessment language is really persuasive, I'd be more comfortable taking that language, which, you know, you know what it is. It's not going to change because of some dynamic within the organization decade, you know, a decade later, because you've said it's the language that's in there now. I'd be more comfortable with that than, than hooking it uh, to, to whatever GARE comes up with. Um, over time. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Tran. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Brownstein, for the recommendation. I think this idea is actually quite intriguing, uh, but I'm actually curious, uh, the threshold, I do have some questions about the threshold, but as you mentioned, I think you said that it's amendable, but when you have, do you have a definition for resident? For resident? Yes. Um, I guess, you know, someone who lives in San Jose, uh, other than, uh, you know, transit, like I wouldn't include somebody who's in, the ho in a hotel for a couple of nights, but basically somebody who is living in San Jose for a substantial amount of time uh, uh, and wants to stay here would be a resident. Um, I think someone who is unhoused but has been unhoused in San Jose for more than a short amount of time would be considered a resident if there's a way to document that. Um, the, you know, I would want to be fairly open, but on the other hand, you have to have some limit. You, I don't want people who show up for a weekend to be considered a resident. Um, and in, in terms of the, the triggers for this assessment, um, you know, we do have, uh, you know, the, the independent auditor's office, you know, and I think they, they regularly audit city procedures. Do you see the equity assessment kind of operating in a similar way where, um, you know, it could roll into the, the, uh, the auditor's office or maybe we're talking about a separate office? Or do, you, do you see envision how this kind of playing out uh, logistically? Yeah, in terms, in terms of staff, I would envision the work being done by two groups of people working together. One is a central body that is assigned to do equity assessments. It could be part of the city manager's office. It could be the city auditor, although they usually have a pretty full workload. Um, it could be the, the race and equity department. 
Uh, but that's one leg of the stool. And the other is the department that's, that actually does that the kind of work. So in other words, if you're talking about uh, uh, access to, if there's a change in, in housing codes and the enforcement of housing codes, you want the code enforcement people to be part of that assessment. You don't want it to be totally done by people who have no connection to code enforcement. That way, if you bring both together, you'll, I think you'll get the best informed assessment that you could, um, that you could wind up with. And mm -hmm. usually some outfit like the auditor's office almost invariably um, has, a, has formal meetings with the department and works closely with the department in terms of trying to um, do those audits and doesn't mm -hmm. sort of do it in a remote way. Okay, and then just one final like a uh, final follow up on a related note. Um, when an equity assessment is triggered, is the policy in question um, or the program in question? Is it paused while the equity assessment is occurring, or does it continue? Uh, you know, simultaneously, does the assessment occur while it's happening? That's that's a great question, and it is the the biggest challenge in terms of in my mind in terms of doing equity assessments. Uh, my hope would be that as the city becomes accustomed to this language in the charter, it tries to time its work so that things that look like they're gonna trigger equity assessments will be put on a timeline so that the equity assessment can be done and the project or policy can still happen when it should. Um, but there will be situations where there are external circumstances that push the city to move very quickly and it may be very hard to do the equity assessment before any decision or any action has been taken. In, the, in, in those cases, I still think there should be an equity assessment, but it may have to change the policy after it's already been, been in place for a while. I don't know how to escape from that problem because there are external conditions that impose time constraints on cities and those are real and you don't want to put the city in the position of not being able to act expeditiously when it really needs to for circumstances that involve protecting people's well-being. Um, but on the other hand, you don't, you don't want the, the equity assessment to be negated completely so that in those kinds of things, which are often things that are urgent and kinds of things where you'd really like to know what the impact is, that you don't lose the ability to understand whether these actions are um, having disproportionate positive or negative impacts on vulnerable constituencies. Thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I have a couple of questions around this, the standards section of the proposal. Um, so, so one is you laid out kind of why you've tried to be fairly focused in defining these standards on things that are directly within the control of the city. Um, but I wanted to push a little bit more about why not to be a little bit more expansive in the definition of goals while acknowledging that, that the city has certain levers to, to achieve goals. So to take the example of, of housing, right? So the housing related language in here right now just focuses on you know, protections and housing codes and uh, for housing standards. However, the Google project is a good example of a place where the city's policy making has an impact on broader goals around you know, the types of language that are in the Detroiters Bill of Rights towards actually being able to have everybody be adequately housed. And so wouldn't there be a way to utilize Perhaps it's the standards language, you know, perhaps it's a, a goal section to to describe sort of those those broader goals while saying the city isn't responsible, you know, can't solely control everybody being unhoused, but but there's the 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 goals and the tools to achieve the goals don't equate to each other. Same with workforce protection, right? We we see this the city using quite a number of different tools to improve workforce protection, um, you know in San Jose and right here we have it just limited to I believe the city's own workforce so so I wanted to ask about and it's a two first I wanted to ask about that as well as um, and perhaps it's related just to ask how you envision this playing out like it's very clear to me um, how 
what types of steps the city would, would take to implement charter language around an equity assessment in actual policy and practice. How do you see the standards playing out through, through how the city implements that in policy and practice? Okay, um, let me um, answer your first question first um, and then go to, to the implementation um, question. I think we need to, to have in mind the difference between equity and um, the level of well-being that we'd like to see. Um, um, you, know, you know, equity um, would be something where each person gets the same kind of treatment from the city in relationship to its capacity. You know, increasing the the uh, level of affordable units that the city produces is increasing that capacity. And those are not really the exact same thing. So um, in this particular measure, I'm talking about equity standards as opposed to capacity goals. Um, and capacity goals is a tougher thing to, in my mind, to get at through the charter. Although if someone can come up with a good way to do it, I'd be interested in seeing it. Um, so right now, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not sure that I can think of a way um, via the charter to deal with something like Google, because you don't know what the next Google is going to be. Um, you know, and so suddenly it's an opportunity of dramatically increasing capacity to do something. Um, uh, but the kind of equity language says that if something like that happens, uh, then you try and have it uh, not disproportionately uh, impact people who are already in good shape, but you have to take care of people who are significantly in need. Um, so yeah, there may be a way to throw it, to, to play around with the a housing affordability that does something like that, but I want to be careful not to be talking about increasing capacity in, in, in this section. I'm not sure whether the chart is the best place to do something like that. Um, and then implementation, you know, and, and fundamentally implementation of this and most process things in the charter is going to depend on, um, the wolf and wharf of community politics. Uh, these give tools to community members and council members who are trying to advance equity to be able to demonstrate that the voters have spoken on charter language. Um, but the the charter language by itself is not is not going to win every battle at the city council, and this is still going to require. Um, other tools and mechanisms, other efforts, other commitments. Um, I want the charter to be able to assist people when they do that. There's, there's, in my mind, rare cases where the charter is going to do all the work for you. Um, so I'm hoping people can be standing at the podium saying, you know, here's the charter language that substantiates this objective. It's been approved by the voters. You have to do it. Um, uh, but that in it, I don't expect that in itself is any guarantee. So uh, all the all the other work has to get done too. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Matsky. Yes. Uh, thank you, um, Bob. The. Uh, We've been talking about equity a lot in this commission from day one, so it's nice to see somebody actually put something on paper that we all can kind of take a look at and see if we we agree. So I appreciate that. I have a couple questions in a couple areas. Um, the first is um, doing the annual um, equity assessment for the budget. And when I look at that and I look at something like sewage collection and treatment, that's a huge expensive operation that isn't changed very easily. And when I think of it, you know, what could be the equity issues? Um, one, I think you have the neighbors of the treatment plant. 
you know, the stinky stuff they have to deal with, but also are the pipes too small in a neighborhood where there's too much backup. So you would do one of these things and you'd have some, you have some findings and results and then, but you really don't change your sewage treatment that easily. So do you really do these things every year and then kind of come up with the same findings? I just wanted to have you address that. And, and the other issue, when I look at this, it reminds me a lot of the California Environmental Quality Act, where you do an assessment and then everybody argues about the results. And those who don't like what's going on will criticize the assessment and use it sometimes inappropriately um, to kind of delay something and to stop progress and whatnot. Or that, that's the that's a criticism. So do you see potential for something like that? And how would you address it if you do? Thanks. Okay, so uh, there were two questions there. Um, first, in terms of the budget, um, you know, to a certain extent, I'm relying on uh, good judgment on the part of city staff and um, priorities from the community. So in other words, parts of the budget that are routine, they don't really have any significant equity issues. I don't expect the city staff to spend a lot of time on them. I don't expect the community to spend a lot of time on them. But in every annual budget, there are, you know, I don't know, a dozen aspects of the budget that, uh, that are ones in which there are significant equity issues and people know about it and argue about it. And often they argue about it without the information that the equity assessment would provide because there hasn't been one. So because there's an actual good gap in time between when the recommended budget comes out and when the city actually votes in June on adapting the budget, there's a good window of time in there in which the equity assessment can take place. Um, I think we take advantage of that um, uh, window and um, you know, like, like anyone who puts a tool in people's hands, you're sort of relying on them using it reasonably and intelligently. I don't think this, I don't think it's likely that people are gonna demand equity assessments of things that nobody really cares about just to, to make work for um, city administrators. And in terms of the comparison to the uh, California Environmental Quality Act, um, uh, this language has gone through the city attorney's office and it was drafted and I think the city attorney will agree this is not something that somebody can litigate on, unlike the California Environmental Quality Act. So nobody can sort of say, you know, hold it, you know, we're going to delay a project for five years because I didn't like the equity assessment. Um, uh, the language here doesn't permit that. And if the language needs to be modified to be sure that you don't get that kind of litigation, I would support that. Um, I'm trying to get information to the community so that they can politically get the city to do the things that they they care about and meet their needs. And I'm I'm not interested in trying to um, uh, create something that's that generates lawsuits. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners? I'm um, seeing none yet. I would, um, Bob, I have two questions. Um, one is in your discussion of equity and the examples you gave, I, I would, um, I'm a little confused because to me, you were giving examples that were of equality, not equity. So your examples were that if everybody has the right to the same thing, and yet in an equity formula, that wouldn't be true. And that's why I'm a little confused because some residents will need more services than others, and that would be equity. Giving everyone the same thing would be equality. So in my mind, I, looking at a standard of equity, we'd really wanna clarify that definition to make sure we're clear that equity is not about equality or everybody getting the same. Am I off or how? No, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely on point. That's an excellent, comment and um, I think this should be um, edited to make sure that it achieves equity and not equality. That is that somebody who 
who really needs more is able to get what they what they need. Um, so um, I, I agree, and I think um, it can be edited to achieve that. Thanks, Bob. So the second question I have is, when I look at the standards question, or the, I'm sorry, the equity assessment question, I, I will give it what I consider some of, some of the bad practice. So the county has a, um, an assessment on the impact on children and families. And so oftentimes the recommendation from staff, the memo will say no impact, right? And really when you think about who's defining that there's no impact, becomes something of a, well, the staff knows that if they put something in there, this thing may not get passed. And so if they can argue there's no literal direct impact on them, then it could, it, I can fill in the form that way. What would preclude our city staff from kind of going that route of, you know, equity impact none, right? And, and, and being kind of in that mode of, for the most part, everything doesn't have an impact and therefore staff would never really recommend that as a, because it is another chunk of work and this will go quicker if we just put no impact. So how would you suggest we avoid that um, operational bad practice that can happen in institutions? Okay, um, good question, uh, sh several ways. I mean, one, this is not something that would be applied to every item, but to ones that specifically um targeted their ones that there's a lot of public attention on majority of city council said we need an analysis or a bunch of people have signed signatures so there's a certain um uh, political salience that is associated here that isn't associated with a line on every transmittal that goes to the board of supervisors that you know somebody has to um, um check off secondly um there's multiple components of the assessment so I mean, somebody could, you know, come back and say on all 10 of these issues, no impact, no impact, no impact, no impact, no impact. But on a major issue, I think they're going to look pretty uh, ridiculous if they do that. And, and most staff people don't want to look that way. Um, and, and third, um, uh, I, I didn't put this in the um, charter. I'm not sure I'd, I'd want to put it in the charter, but certainly my I think the right way to do these assessments, as I mentioned earlier, is to have two entities both working on the assessment. That is some central group, whether it's the Department of Race and Equity or the city auditor's office and the department itself. So the, if the department or the other one tries to take a position that is essentially failing to do due diligence, you hope that the, their partner entity will be a check and say, wait a minute, we really can't see impacts here and we're going to uh, bring them out so the public will know about them. Thank you, I love the trigger mechanism. I think that really would be helpful and I would support Commissioner Amador's thinking around using the GAR, or, the, or your idea of the content of the GAR to really help us formulate something that, that has some teeth to it because otherwise I do, I do have a fear that assessments can get um, watered down or not taken seriously. Um, commissioners, any other questions or thoughts, feedback? I see no hands. Then on behalf of the commission, uh, Bob, I wanna say thank you to you for your really thoughtful um, commentary for getting us the materials early so folks could, re could read them and go through them and then to be here tonight with us and for your participation throughout the commission's time. So appreciate it. Um, it's great to see you. Um, I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. So long. I believe our next speaker is here. Yes, she is. There she is. Um, um, I want to now introduce Alina Yin. Alina is on the San Jose Council Advisory Appointment Commission, um, and I welcome her. She's been contributing to our uh, commission's feedback. So welcome her on our behalf tonight. Uh, Alina, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Fred. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners and members of the public. Uh, my name is Alina Yin, pronoun she, they, and I would like to first 
you know, um, thank you for this privilege and honor to present to you this evening. Um, I have not missed a meeting and I've been here since January and it's been um, quite a whirlwind ride for all of us. And, you know, before we begin, I want to kind of formally introduce myself and why I'm presenting this evening. And so, you know, I am a born and raised resident in District 4 to a Cambodian refugee immigrant parents. And I have been volunteering with my community since pretty much I was uh, 12. And um, through many different uh, programs at school and through organizations, I've always been deeply passionate about my community and I've chosen to dedicate my career and service to it. You know, I take uh, immense joy in studying systems and how they work. Uh, my background and career stems from nearly 15 years of working within local government systems through various private and nonprofit entities. I've been working with uh, public works and water and wastewater treatment systems. Um, through planning, architecture, and community engagement, my job was in uh, estimating marketing business development, and it was to understand how to work within government processes and procedures. In 2016, I transitioned to uh, nonprofit work where I continue to serve my community. I was the former co-founder of Local Color, a San Jose arts nonprofit, and a founding board member of Catalyze SV. Uh, currently, I run and produce a podcast called Only San Jose, and we're focused on civic education, and our first season covers the many different boards and commissions at the city of San Jose. And you know, I got into this work and became very motivated by the work of boards and commissions because of the Google development project. And I felt a need to become more involved because of the major implications of this development. I asked pretty simple questions of, you know, how does this get approved? And what is the process like? Which led me to the planning commission that I wasn't very familiar with before. And which led me to all the other commissions as a whole and um, understanding why do we have so many vacancies and how can I start? So I started a podcast to provide education and I joined the commission. I'm now uh, a commissioner of the Council Appointment Advisory Commission. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Appointment Advisory Commission, formerly Project Diversity. And it was established in 1991 by Mayor Susan Hammer. Um, however, this evening, you know, I want to also speak from a resident perspective. And the following presentation that I have um, is designed both for the commissioners and members of the public for people who are tune tuning in for the first time and are not as familiar. And so I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> and um, part of this presentation I designed for the youth commission that I presented to a few weeks ago. And so it has a little youthful spirit to it. Um, and if you can see the, the screen, perfect. Okay, so um, why boards and commissions are so important and a part of the, the legislative and democratic process. And we deal with a lot of documents. And so I kind of um, like to take us back to some basics. And you know, this has been a, a part of like the American staple since I was a kid and um, it talks about the important documents of our country and our city and the county. And, you know, another analogy I like to make is, you know, they, it is very important. This is uh, one of my favorite movies and um, it kind of just illustrates, you know, the uh, finality sometimes of these types of documents. Um, Bob said there are no magic wands here, but an analogy I like to use is that when we're talking about the law, it's almost kind of, uh, the analogy I use is that it's kind of like magic. Though it doesn't look like, you know, the things that we're used to seeing in Disney movies and on, in the movies, it looks more like this. And the documents are not talking and they're not sparkly, they look more like this. And once these documents are written and signed into law, they become our lived realities. This is a picture of the Japanese internment camps. Um, this is a protest during the civil rights movement. And this is how it kind of uh, affects our lived reality. And in turn, it also affects our arts and culture and how we perceive and express what is happening to us. And when there is turmoil and distress within our community, in our country, one of the ways that people respond is through marching and protesting. And the, this is the form of resistance that most people are most familiar with. And what this leads to at the end of the day is back to these chambers and um, or more locally, these chambers or, you know, to today, um, 
we're all on Zoom now. And so the um, importance about boards and commissions and the legislative process is that it holds a lot of powers to affect our, our lived reality. And to just go over some basic documents, you know, um, the city of San Jose is, is uh, governed by the charter and municipal code. We are all here um, to examine this legal document. And um, this is our city constitution, and it is the founding uh, document that really kind of systematically affects everything else that we do in the city. And similar to how the state legislator creates laws adopted in codes to implement the California constitution, the city of San Jose adopts ordinance and impl implements them upon um, the city charter. And the city council can typically amend the ordinance code at any time through a majority vote. And there is a link on the bottom. Uh, another form is council policies and administrative policies. And these are procedures which further assist to interpret and administer the will of the charter, the ordinance code, and uh, council and administration. And so boards and commissions um, and how this all impacts, because we deal with some of these policies, we deal with studying them, we deal with break, making recommendations. And boards and commissions in the United States exist in all branches of government. There are presidential to congressional commissions, there are state redistricting and a number of state commissions. And then we have you know, our planning commissions, our ethic commissions, and uh, our charter commissions. And where this all started, uh, commissions started around the progressive area, uh, era during the first half of the 20th century, where there was widespread social activism and there was a lot of development and uh, progress in the United States that spanned from 1890 to 1920s. And the example that I want to use of how commissions kind of got started was actually through building codes. And this was in New York City, and um, it all started with building codes that were ensuring that residents could have um oops i just lost that sorry <clears throat> that they would have um, fire escapes air shafts and basic safety windows and toilets this resulted in um poorer families not being able to live in these uh new codes uh or these new buildings that were being built to meet these new codes um and Another program that started was City Beautiful, and it was the first self-identified planning movement in the U.S., coalescing around the 1909 National Conference on City Planning and Congestion. And so this began to set new standards for urban design and aesthetics, and um, projects were often built on centrally located land um, that was inhibited by low-income people, people uh, immigrants, and people of color. An example is um, when New York City built the Central Park over Seneca Village, which was the largest settlement of Black Americans um, at that time, as well as German and Irish immigrants at that time. And people, um, the local elites during that time really wanted a more beautiful city, but they refused to pay for these developments. And so the solution that I came up with was to create a form of municipal planning with strong public input and that became the City Planning Commission. And most city planning commissions have been established in the first half century, uh, the first 20th, since the first half of the 20th century. And these commissions in the beginning, in some places still now, um, were often populated by real estate elites who tried to ensure that city planning decisions would stimulate profits. And how it, is all boiling down. So now we're going to talk about, you know, the boards and commissions of the city of San Jose. And defined by the city is city boards and commissions were established for the purpose of advising the city council and providing ongoing input into policies and issues affecting the future of the San Jose community. And I wanted to go over some um, statistics. Oh, I'm sorry, first, we'll go over the statistics that I'm going to share. Um, I want us to view under a racial equity lens. These three um, points are pulled from the Office of Racial Equity. And so we're looking at racial equity, equity we're looking at inclusion and racial justice. So currently we have 29 commissions and the number of commissioners we had was 276 out of 326. There are currently 50 vacancies right now. 
And this data was provided by the, the city clerk's office. This is also some other data that has been collected from the last three years. So again, um, you know, these are the number of applications that we've received each year. And then there are the number of average uh, annual vacancies. And so I wanna just go back a little bit, like we have 326 seats that term out, um, I believe twice a year um, in different intervals. And we don't even receive enough applications to fill all those seats. And it's projected that our annual vacancy is going to continue to grow. These are some of the statistics um, provided from applicants. And so you'll see here that the, the number of applicants um, that we get the most are from D6, and then it moves on down through D9, D5, and D4. And then on the left, you'll see the number of members actually appointed from these um, applicants. Another set of data. So we have some, um, we are, seem to be doing pretty well on uh, gender equity and representation. And as far as um, representation from different cultural backgrounds, the number of applications that we receive the most from is actually the Asian community at 37%. Second is um, white community from uh, 34%. However, the number of members appointed to most boards and commissions are 50%. Um, white and at 24% Asian and 50% um, 15 Hispanic and so on and so forth. And so that is just to reflect kind of the state of boards and commissions and how we're doing on representation. And um, this is pulled from GARE on why representation matters. And um, there have been many studies done um, since 2016, and the uh, buck of it is that diversity, equity, and inclusion in all government leads to an overall increase of political efficacy. Political efficacy is the belief that one's civic participation leads to the meaningful social change, further stabilizing our democratic process. And this is um, kind of I wanted to showcase how our community is being impacted by not having proper representation on our boards and commissions. For example, the San Jose flea market, um, this was a development proposal that was approved by the planning commission around the 90s. And if we um, just kind of think back to what Bob was saying, if we had, for example, a, uh, an equity assessment or equity values that were in place, then a development plan that displaces 95% of the vendors there probably wouldn't have passed. And also there are, um, there's been many uh, other headlines that you can see here, I won't go into them there. But that is just to, um, to share the amount of impact that these decisions can have on the community. And then I wanna share some new best practices and so in October 2019, um, Governor Newsom signed Senate Bill 225 that said that regardless of citizen, citizenship status, any person that is a resident of California has the right to serve on a government board and commission. And there are cities right now across California that have been updating their charters to reflect that. And so they're removing the requirement that you have to be a US citizen. For our boards and commissions, we have only a handful, and one of them is a planning commission that you must be a, a registered US citizen to be able to qualify to serve on that board. So other best practices is, um, this is an example from the County of San Mateo, and they run an annual Civics 101 Academy to help uh, reach uh, other communities and to bring more diverse perspectives um, and representation within their commissions and their process of um, governance. And um, another not mentioned here is uh, Urban Habitat. They run a Boards and Commission Leadership Institute that really focuses on um, outreach to low-income communities and um, people of color and of diverse backgrounds and different kinds of representation to include them at the table so they can also be a part of the decision-making process, which is part of one of the main principles of GARE. Oops. 
And um, in regards to city planning, some best practices, uh, I pulled them from the city of Baltimore, who have been working to reform their city planning department, and they have started adding some equity lens into how they approve, approve their projects, which is a little bit similar to um, you know, a previous presentation. If we were to place these values and the equity lens into the charter or into sections of the charter that um, are, we're creating decisions and we're approving development that affects low income communities or other communities that have been historically marginalized and not representative. And so this is um, some, uh, some examples of how other cities are doing that are beginning to address that. And um, another one is providing a stipend. And so right now in our city charter, which is uh, Article X, Boards and Commissions Section 1001, one proposal would be that in, um, all boards and commissions uh, would be able to receive a stipend. Um, to the left, you'll see that these are the current boards and commissions that do have a stipend. And I understand that there's probably some economic feasibility and concerns towards this. It doesn't really have to be all at once. It could be a phased approach. There's many different ways to um, address this. But part of it is um, to increase participation, especially people who are facing socioeconomic barriers and do not have the time um, to volunteer their time for free. And it also shows that we value their, our, value their um, expertise and lived experiences. And also these commissions that have a stipend typically are almost always full and they do not have um, large vacancies. Whereas my, my commission, for example, has been, um, we have been unable to fill our seats. And so we haven't had quorum for almost six months or more. And there's a lot of com uh, commissions that have been facing this uh, problem, including um, the Board of Fair Campaign and Pill Practices. Up until recently, they were unable to fill their seats. And so I feel that, you know, providing uh, a stipend for commissioners, especially, you know, you're spending a lot of time reviewing documents, you're attending meetings, and you're listening to the community. And so this is a, a good way to uh, show people and residents that we value their time and participation. And um, to, to build off of our first presenter, um, you know, extending best practices, when I presented at the Youth Commission, they had their retreat and they actually um, went and reformed all of their bylaws to remove the um, gender pronouns to they, them. And they also have been working on a Youth Bill of Rights. And um, there's a lot of fantastic examples that they've been working very hard on that I feel that the the Charter Commission would really value um, their insight. And that concludes the presentation. And I would be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Thank you, Nina. Awesome presentation. Commissioners, any questions, thoughts, feedback? Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you very much for the, the presentation and the background. Um, you know, there's so, and, and for the breadth of, of sort of possible approaches and recommendations, um, I'm wondering if there are particular ones here that you're seeing as, as critical for, uh, well, and first I wanna acknowledge that I think we've discussed as a commission that our recommendations can um, include both charter amendments as well as sort of flagging here are other <clears throat> policies or practices that don't belong in the charter per se, but are important to, to share with city council and, and be part of the discourse in San Jose. So acknowledging that, are there particular areas of your recommendations that you're seeing as critical for charter amendment versus other types of policy tools? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Um, One second, um, you might, I think, Died. <clears throat> yeah. How is it now? Oh, now we can't hear you at all. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. There we go. Sorry, please. No problem. Can you hear better yeah. now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So thank you. And um, acknowledging that we've talked about the, the possibility for our final report to include both recommendations for charter amendments mm -hmm. and other either policy recommendations or areas of policy that have been sort of uncovered through our process that we see as important. Um, you offered a breadth of, of sort of recommendations, opportunities, options, models. I'm wondering which of them you're seeing as priorities for charter amendment um, versus, you know, other types of policy tools. Yes, um, I think the updating the um, the charter sections that require um, residents to be a U.S. citizen can be updated to reflect the the state laws that have been signed and passed, and also that other cities have already been um, been working to change their charters to update and reflect that. Additionally, I think um, providing a stipend that is an article that is written into the charter and so changing that so that all commissioners will be provided a stipend is something that I feel that would really help to increase um, participation and diversity and representation within the boards and commissions. Vice Chair Johnson, you had your hand up. Did you have a question or was that the right same question? My question is already answered. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, anyone else? Any other hands up? I see Jose Posadas, Commission, Commissioner Posadas. Commissioner Posadas? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, Alina. Um, so I was curious if in the data that you've come across, have you noticed any pattern of um, commissioners serving across different commissions or do they seem to just go to one commission and after their term is over, we never as a city hear from them again because that would be an indication of another issue that might be addressed at some point. And it's not just the stipend, maybe it's just the burnout uh, from a commissioner working on a uh, commission for several years. I do not have that data. Um, I think the, the city clerk's office um, would probably I'm not sure if that data is tracked, if there are commissioners going to other commissions. I know that I personally do know some, but that's anecdotal. So I don't have um, the data available for that, unfortunately. Hi, the, um, hi this is Tony, University Clerk. Um, uh, we don't track it, but I could say that they're, they're only allowed to serve on one commission at a time. And we do have some commissioners that have applied for multiple, um, like finish one commission and then move to another one. Um, but there's not a lot that it's a small number, but it, it does happen. And a lot of times some people are only interested in that one topic. So they're not necessarily interested in moving, say from arts commission to senior commission. Thank you, the city clerk. Um, Commissioner Matsumura, your hands up again. Yes, although let me pause just in case there's anybody who's- Yeah, I don't see any of their hands right now, so go ahead. Okay, um, I, I did, you went very fast through the data about representation on commissions and comparing applications to um, who serves on commissions. You know, of course, some of the racial data were very eye popping. I'm wondering if, if you've conducted or aware of any other analysis by the Office of Racial Equity, et cetera, that <clears throat> unpacks some of what we're seeing in the, um, the racial data or also potentially the demographic data um, that, you know, went by fast enough, I didn't quite catch it all. Yes. Um, there, I'm not sure if there are any data available um, on, on that, unfortunately, because the a council appointment process is at the discretion of the council. And so we don't know how they make their decisions. And um, there hasn't been a lot of tracking. And I think the Office of Racial Equity, I'm not sure if that's in their work plan yet. I know that the office is still getting started. But if we were to do a equity assessment, for example, I feel like this would be, you know, a big one to address and look at. I'm not sure if the city clerk has any other information to add on that. But in terms of, um, yes, the representation, there is a lot of disparity and that there is room for improvement. But without the rules laid out on who is qualified and who is not, it's really hard to determine how those choices are made.
Okay, I see. Oh. Commissioner Siegel. Commissioner Siegel. You're on mute. Thank you. I think I'm asking the same question as uh, Commissioner Matsumura. Um, it seemed like you were saying that um, the Asian population submits the most applications, but is not given the most amount of seats on boards and commissions. Is that true? Did I, did I see that right? It did go by quickly. Yes, and I can, um, I can share that if, if everybody would like to see that again. Um, yes, that is correct. So the, um, the number of applicants that we receive um, the most from is the Asian population. And um, currently it is not represented in our membership. And let me share that. So this is the, the data. I agree it is definitely an area to pay attention to and to assess in why the outcome is this way, but boards and commissions in general, um, I'm not sure if they've ever even been audited. And so there is not a lot of available data on uh, the current uh, state. Um, hi, this is Tony Tabor, city clerk. Um, demographic data was also not tracked prior to I think it's 2014. We didn't track it before I started here. It's self-reported. Not every application includes the data. So some of them leave it blank. Um, and she's correct. We don't, we haven't done a, a examination of qualifications of each board and commission member versus their gender and their ethnicity to see if that's an issue. We did do a study a few years ago um, to make sure our population kind of was tracking with our boards and commissions. And at the time it was, the white percentage was lower um, when we looked at the applications a few years ago. Um, it was around the 30% range. So we our, our numbers were tracking with the population. I see that currently, um, we're not quite tracking with the population as we were a few years ago, um, but we haven't we haven't done that full. Let's review every application and every position um, because there's a lot that goes into boards and commissions. It's in, in addition to race and ethnicity, um, HCDC, for instance, has low income requirements, so. It's possible somebody might be less qualified than somebody else, but they have the low income requirement that we need. Um, so it's, it's very complicated. And it, there is room for improvement. I definitely agree with that. It's just not as simple as it seems. Thank you. All right, seeing no further questions, I wanna on behalf of the commission again, uh, thank you Elena for joining us tonight for your work. Uh, and for being one of our faithful members of the public. So um, your thoughtful comments are always appreciated. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, at this time, we have a cancellation of our next speaker who canceled uh, late today due to a family emergency. And so we will go to the public comment. Public comment is in two parts tonight. First is any comments that you have about the speakers or the questions or any of the uh, presentations that were made. We will finish that public comment, and then we have the second public comment, which is for any item not on the agenda tonight that you want to uh, make sure that goes to the commission. And so I'll ask um, the city clerk to call the first speaker. Give me just a second. Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I don't have a little clock. Um, you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, good. No clock. Hey, right, it's coming. It, it takes a minute to open it up. All right, thanks. Lee. Go ahead. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just really appreciated Bob Brownstein. I think I said his name right. Uh, his comments uh, on equity 
um, and how critical it was and that we needed to get it into every part of our documentation wherever we could. I thought that was very um, important and it related to the issues of our climate crisis as we are proposing for it to become into our charter. And it's for those same reasons of the criticalness of it that we need to incorporate it into whatever documentation as we go forward. And, and that being very critical, our climate crisis and how we are going to go to zero uh, fossil fuel use uh, as quickly as we can is very critical. And so I just bringing that, you know, just appreciated what Bob was saying in regard, regards to equity. And it's the similar things as we, you know, deal even with our climate crisis, how it's going to have that equity issue, because the same issues have been coming up with our pollution in that we have um, um, what is, it's called um, environmental racism. And so it's the same issues as we go forward to create a livable earth that you know we're going to have to be doing, working on to make that so very rapidly um, because it's becoming less and less uninhabitable, it's becoming more and more uninhabitable. And so how to you know, integrate the equity issues in regards to that is very critical as we go forward in, in integrating our policies and hopefully our charter review to address our climate crisis. And that, you know, I, I think that, um, like it, they, they say in terms of, you know, you have to follow the money. The issues with our climate crisis is that we have to degrow. So there is no, there's not like I have an agenda to say, oh, you know, this is something I'm interested in. And, you know, what is my economic gain? Because there is no economic gain because everything has to degrow. And that, that's where the truth comes out. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting tonight. It was really nice to hear uh, people talking about uh, important good issues and ideas of equity. Uh, I was really interested in the words of Bob Brownstein talking about the ideas of, uh, uh, you know, equity, needs help from from many institutions in the future of San Jose. Uh, and and it's those it's that work and effort uh, that I find really interesting and hopeful. And um, you you're learning as a city charter commission how to coordinate that. So after you're done as a commission, we can we can know where to go and, and find different resources to be uh, organizing and building uh, these good equi equity ideas, good ideas of the future reimagine, hopefully good open democratic practices as well. Uh, we can have a real um, good future with, with, with these sort of study sessions. So thanks a lot for the meeting tonight and uh, keep up the good work and uh, thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Paul Soto. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. In 1850, the city charter was formulated. In 1851, January 6, 1851, Peter Burnett stated, and I quote, that the war of extermination of the Indians is to be expected. Although it is with great regret, it is beyond the will or the will or wisdom of man to avert, end quote. The decapitations of Native Americans and Mexicans occurred right here in this city. At the time that that charter was made, are you unaware of this? I want to know if everybody on this council is aware of the decapitations that were ordered by Peter Burnett at the foundation of this charter. I want to know the answer of that question. Secondly, I broke down crying. When Mr. Brownstein stated and, and articulated, I know for a fact that he knew Fred Hirsch. There is no way that Mr. Brownstein could not have known Fred Hirsch. And the way that Sophie Mendoza marched on Roosevelt Junior High School, because they were beating Mexicans and they were shaming them and humiliating them and degrading them and dehumanizing them for speaking Spanish. Ms. Matsumoto, you made an enemy. You have an enemy in Paul Soto. Every single meeting I see you at, I will do everything. Um, we don't tolerate 
threats, direct threats against commissioners. So back to the commission. Next speaker. There's no more speakers. Thank you. I now call for um, the public to be able to address the commission on an item not on the tonight's agenda. Do we have any speakers? I have no hands up. Great. Um, thank you, Madam Clerk. I'm going to now adjourn our meeting um, according to our agenda. Our next scheduled meeting of the Charter Review Commission is September 13th, 2021 at 5.30. It is a virtual meeting. Um, Chair, I think, I think the agenda said we're talking about other items. Uh, I don't believe so. This has just been a study session. That's what the agenda, the public agenda calls for. Commissioner Amador? Yes, I was going to also ask about that because um, we wanted to make sure, well, I wanted to make sure that our subcommittee got another um, half day that we were, that we had voted back in August 9th. Yeah, that should be on the agenda for on Monday um, as part of the work plan update. So I got the notice about it, but this commission, this agenda does not have us taking action, but only doing a study session tonight. So I don't, I can't take on an item that's not on the agenda, but that it will be on the agenda on Monday when we have the update on the work plan. Mr. Siegel, you're on you. Yes, I'm looking at the agenda and I'm looking at item four on the agenda on tonight's agenda, which is meeting schedule. Um, so we want to talk about just the meeting schedule briefly. Um, where we there's a half day that um, hasn't been scheduled for us and we have speakers. We don't know when that half day is. Um, so if, if you want to reserve that for Monday, we can. Yes, and, I, and I'm happy to take that up. I got your note this afternoon and I'm happy to look at that. We're going to need to figure out the schedule. Monday's okay. schedule though, we'll be discussing the commission giving it so the options that it was asked to pull back, um, to bring back. So I think it'll come up in that discussion anyway, but it definitely will be part of the discussion for the uh, adaptation of the work plan since that's where the timeline is. Thank you. And and my my next question had to do with um, the agenda for this meeting did not include what the study topics were and did not include who the speakers were. It was simply five names put together. We did ask the clerk several times um, to actually include the topics of LGBTQ. Um, Bob's topics, like just give a description. So if people are actually interested in those topics, they would want to come here and listen. Does but the clerk want to address that uh, concern? The um, the topic was, we used our, our regular study session topic the way we have for the previous ones. The speaker names are on there. Um, I can't make significant changes to an agenda after it's posted. We were asking way before it was posted to be, you know. We, and we included the title. Topic. We included the title that we had agreed on originally when we set the study session topics. But nobody knew what the topics are. Nobody knew what 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 was going to be spoken about. It was just five names put together with no understanding of who, what, what the topic was or who the people were. Who do they work for? So I think that may have discouraged people from coming here tonight because they didn't know what we were studying. I'm wondering if going forward, we can actually put the speakers who they are and what they'll be talking about. Again, I, I'm, we can't make a decision about that, but I, I take it under advisement and we'll look at how we can do that as we go forward, uh, especially within the timelines that uh, are dictated for posting. That is that is the challenge for us in terms of the posting timelines, but we certainly can be able to work through that. Commissioner okay. Barosio. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I emailed Lawrence um, and Civic Makers about possibly giving us some updated promotional material as we do our um, presentations in neighborhood associations and community groups. Um, 
when Commissioner Amador and I uh, presented um, it to a community organization, we saw that some of the dates weren't in alignment with, with the updated um, uh, calendar. So I wonder if, uh, I did see an email on Monday that Lawrence was gonna give us an updated uh, toolkit. Um, and I wonder the status of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Megan, if you could make note of that and follow up with the, do you have a response, Megan? Yeah, uh, Lawrence had noted that he's gonna send that to me tomorrow and I'll distribute it to you guys as soon as I get it. To Perfect. you all as soon as I get it. Perfect, thank you. All right, I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna adjourn us until the September 13th meeting. Uh, thank you all for your participation tonight and we'll see you next Monday. Thank you.